Here we have the dispensations of the Lord. And they're divided in three areas. From Genesis all the way through Acts 7, that's time past. Today, this is where we are right here. This is where we are today, scripturally speaking. It's called, but now. Over here, it's the ages to come. That's from Hebrews to Revelation. And these are some of the events that take place. And you'll notice, you'll notice over here that Israel was promised a kingdom. And the kingdom was at hand. It was offered, but it was rejected. And Israel was set aside temporarily. But one day in the future, over here, after we're taken out of here in the rapture, over here, Israel, one-third of them will be saved. So God hasn't forgotten his people. But this is where we are today. This is our marching orders for today. This is where we find our salvation that's different from their salvation. That's very, very important. So as I go through this, I hope that I can explain this to all of us, okay? And for us who rightly divide and so on, let me just say that uh, repetition is very, very important so that it sinks down in our mind and our hearts so we can be able to give an answer to when people ask us questions, amen? Now, the title of my message this morning is Rightly Dividing of Dispensations. Second Timothy chapter 2 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. What? Rightly dividing, cutting it straight, dividing it properly. That's what that means. You ever wonder why believers, why do they we can eat pork? Amen. <laughs> Some good old sausage with bacon, eggs, and sausage, and so on. Amen. But Israel, in the Old Testament, in the four Gospels, Book of Acts, they could not eat pork. Have you ever wondered why Christians can't seem to get along or agree on most things? You ever wonder why we have so many denominations that's going on? Or what about all those seemingly contradictions in the Bible. All of these things are valid and they have concerns about some of those things. We do. But when the believer begins to understand dispensations, when he begins to see rightly dividing, these seemingly difficulties, they begin to get cleared up. Uh, they begin to be resolved. Now to rightly divide means God has dealt with mankind at different times with different expectations from man. He dealt with them back here, a little bit different, a little bit different here, a little bit different here, and so on. Different message at different times with those people. And it's important for us, and it's profitable for us, that we learn the Bible. No question about that. But it's vital we understand which part of the Bible is intended primarily for us today in the dispensation of grace. Now, if you'd go to a modern post office and you would see what's going on, it's very confusing. Matter of fact, if you went to a post office and you saw that all the mail was piled up in a corner and the way they would distribute that mail is as customers come by, they just would randomly give them a letter. Uh, it'd be all messed up, wouldn't it? It actually would be crazy. The postal employees have to rightly divide the mail in order to deliver it correctly to each person or whose address it is to be delivered to. Amen? So the post office even rightly divides. And if they do, we in Scripture should do that. Now we're blessed with what was addressed to those of other dispensations. We glean truths from that. I understand that. But we must not confuse theirs, their mail, with our own private mail. It's a mistake for us to carry out their instructions that were only given to them. Their mail orders are different than mine and yours. All the Bible is for us, no question about it. But it's for our learning, our profit, an example, yes, but all the Bible is not to us specifically. What he wrote to Israel is different than he writes to the body of Christ, the church today, amen? amen. Now, the dispensations in time past. It states in Ephesians 2.1, he says, Wherefore, remember that... Being in time past, Gentiles, in the flesh, and so on. 
So there's a time past here that included these dispensations. And then he states in Ephesians 2.13, but now in Christ Jesus. So there's a period of time that's for us today. It's called but now. And then in Ephesians 2.7, he says this. He says that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his kindness. The ages to come is from here and for the rest of time. So you have these three groups that have different, different periods of time, the way God dealt with mankind. Time passed, but now ages to come. Now we know this, you study the Bible at all, that Israel was promised a kingdom on earth, a kingdom as if it were heaven on earth. Two individual people would be sent to tell the timing of it, the closeness of that kingdom. Malachi 3.1 says this here, Behold, I will send my messenger, that's John the Baptist, and he shall prepare the way before me and the Lord whom you seek and so on. So that tells us something. The forerunner will be John the Baptist and the Lord will be Jesus Christ. That fulfillment for the people of Israel was fulfilled. In Matthew, you see John the Baptist. In those days came who? John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. And so it's John the Baptist prepares for the coming of the Christ, the Messiah. Then Jesus comes on the scene in Matthew 4, 17. For that time, Jesus began, from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John the Baptist, then Christ came on the scene. The kingdom of heaven, it's near. It's close, if you would believe, as a nation. And there... It's that heaven on earth kingdom he's talking about. Deuteronomy eleven twenty one shares it, that your days to Israel may be multiplied in the days of your children in the land, which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give them, as the days of heaven upon the earth. Heaven on earth, why? Because the king of kings would be sitting on the throne in Jerusalem on David's throne there, and ruling an entire world. Heaven on earth, because God would be present here. Israel looked for this kingdom, this heaven on earth, with their Messiah on the throne in Israel. There's no doubt God has called Israel his special people. They were promised, covenant, unconditionally. They were promised one day they would be a kingdom of priests. It states in Exodus 9, 16, or 9, 6, 19, 6, can't say. And you shall be unto me, what? A kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And it's for the children of Israel. They're going to be a kingdom of priests. Isaiah 61, 6. But ye shall be named the priest of the Lord. Men shall call you ministers of our God. Ye shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory shall you boast. They're going to be a kingdom of priests one day, a nation of priests. Peter says it like this in 1 Peter, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal, what? Priesthood, and he's writing to the Jewish people, a holy nation. And then in Revelation, when it comes to a conclusion, blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection, on such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God, of Christ, and shall reign with him, how long? A thousand years. And that will happen right over here one day. It deals with the nation of Israel. Not you, not me, the nation of Israel. That's very, very important. Amen? So when Christ came, Israel was spiritually down. And he understood since Israel was a favored nation, if anybody were saved, they had to go through Israel. That's why he says in John 4, 22, Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the, of the Jew. For one to be saved, if he were Gentile, he had to embrace the Jewish religion. Amen? So when Christ came, he came 
not to the world at that time. He came only for and to the Jewish people. When Christ came to the earth, he came for his own people, for their own land. Can I prove that? Matthew chapter 10, verse 5 and following. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Christ himself said, you don't go to Gentiles. Hello, what are you? You're a Gentile. Don't go to you. Not at that time. You just go to the nation of Israel. Why? It's through Israel that people were to be saved. Amen? Matthew 15, 24, he says this, But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You get that? Do you believe what you read? Amen? Paul said this in Romans 15, 8. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision, the Jewish people, for of the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. What did he promise the fathers? One day they would be a kingdom of priests. Christ will be on the throne in Jerusalem. That's what they were promised. And that's what he came to fulfill. Now, just believe what it says. Their gospel to the Jews was Christ, He's the Son of God, the prophesied Messiah, the Christ. That was their message. That's what they had to believe. They did not have to believe the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ like you do or we do today. They believed he's the Christ, and that was enough to save them. John 20, verse 30 and 31, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe. What? that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. You don't believe the death, burial, and resurrection. You believe he is the Messiah, that prophesied one, and he's fulfilled that. John 4, 29 says this, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this what? The Christ. Not that he's going to go and die for our sins, be buried and rise again, but he's the Messiah. He's the Christ. Peter stood up in Matthew 16. He said this. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's what they believed. That was the message. And their message, the Jews were saved by faith, requiring certain works proving their faith. Faith, yes, but God required certain things that give evidence that their faith was real and genuine, like circumcision, law observance, signs, repentance, and water baptism. Can you prove that? Matthew 19, 16, 17. And behold, one came, said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, what? What's the commandments? The law. Keep the commandments. Acts 15, 1 and 5. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. Verse 5. And there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, now get this, which believed, they had embraced Christ as Messiah, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Hello? Circumcision important? Genesis 17, 14. And the uncircumcised man-child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that so shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. Pretty serious, wasn't it? Mark 16, 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. People jump on that immediately. But who's he writing to? When? Where? What? Why? Huh? Shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. 
Acts 2, 36 says this, Therefore let all the house of who? Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? We've crucified our Messiah, the Christ. Then Peter said unto them, Repent of what you've done and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That was their message, circumcision, law observance, signs, repentance, water baptism. And then their hope was eternal life. They, their hope of reward was one day they'd be in that kingdom with Christ their Messiah. Zechariah 14.9 says this, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth in that day. Shall there be one Lord and his name one. Daniel 7.13 I saw in the night visions, behold, one like the Son of Man, Christ, came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. One other, Zephaniah 3.14. Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all the heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord hath taken away thy judgments. He hath cast out thine enemy. The king of Israel, even the Lord, is in the midst of thee. Thou shalt not see evil anymore. That's when he reigns. That's when he rules. Understand that the Jewish people back here, even going through the Gospels and Acts, they had limited understanding. They had limited knowledge. They had no clue to the accomplishment of the death of Christ, the burial, and his resurrection. They did not preach what we preach today. They didn't even know it, so how could they preach it? You say, can you prove that? Matthew 16, I'm using a lot of verses today. You're just going to, just later on get the, the message, please. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Hallelujah! Is that what he says? Then Peter t took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Hey, you're not going to die. They had no clue why he would die. Then it states in Mark 9, 31, 32, For he taught his disciples and said unto them, The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him, and after that he is killed, he shall rise the third day. But they understood not that saying and were afraid to ask him. If they didn't understand him dying and rising from the grave, let alone what it accomplished, how could they have been preaching the message we preach today? They did not preach our message in the Gospels or Acts. It wasn't until it was revealed to the Apostle Paul that we realized he died for our sins, was buried, and rose again for our justification. Amen? Luke 18, 31, Then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked and spitefully entreated and spitted on. And they shall scourge him and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. And they understood none of these things. And this thing was, hello, hid from them. Not only did they not understand, God didn't want them to understand it yet. So they could not have preached what we preach today. Even after the resurrection, John 20, verse 8 and 9, they went in also that other disciple which came first to the sepulcher and he saw and believed. For as yet knew not the scripture that he must rise. This is even after his resurrection. They still didn't even know he was supposed to rise from the dead. 
because God hid that truth from them. It was not to the Jewish people, it was not good news Christ was crucified. It was presented, you've committed a crime in crucifying the Messiah. Acts 2, 22 says, You men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Not good news. You criminals, you killed our Messiah. And that's why you need to repent. Amen? So the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, its full accomplishment was kept secret, hidden on purpose until Israel as a nation had totally rejected Christ as their Messiah. They did that, and they crucified him. But remember on the cross, Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And God, the Father, always hears the Son's prayers. As a result of that, they're given another chance. And Acts 1 through 7 is that another chance. And they offered the kingdom to Israel, and Israel still wouldn't believe and said, no, we will not have this man to reign over us. And they stoned Stephen. And that was the deal that broke the camel's back right there. Romans eleven twenty five 25 says, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. Israel, when that kingdom was offered, it was rejected there in Acts, Israel has been temporarily set aside. Amen? That's very, very important. As a nation, a new program then emerged, the Gospel of Grace program. Romans 11, 11 says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall Israel? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation is coming to the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch that I am the apostle of the Gentiles. I magnify my office. God emerged a new program with a new apostle, the apostle Paul. Acts 20, 24 says this here, but none of these things move me, neither can I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry which I received of the Lord Jesus to testify of what? The gospel of the grace of God. Now, why this new program? Why was this new program hidden, kept from Israel? 1 Corinthians 2, 7 and 8 says, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. Now, get this, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Satan would not have permitted the crucifixion of Jesus Christ if he knew what the cross and the empty tomb would accomplish. As a result of that, God hid it, not only from Satan, but even his own disciples. Amen? Now you, now you begin to pick up a little bit why they didn't understand. You see, the death of Christ and his resurrection it purchased back a portion of the heavenlies and the title deed to this earth that Adam lost in the garden. And get this, and it also gave Israel a legitimate time to offer the kingdom to the people of Israel. Now get this, for them to offer the kingdom, you couldn't be preaching this gospel, that's the cart before the horse. You don't be doing that. You do this first, and then this comes later. And so for it to be a genuine offer to the nation of Israel, this here was hid from them. So that when they rejected, it was a true rejection of that kingdom offer. Amen? Now, the body of Christ, which we are in, if you're saved today, it's right here. 
It began with Paul. He was saved in Acts chapter 9. Paul wrote Romans through Philemon. Okay, that's very, very important. 1 Timothy 1, 15, 16. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy that in me, what? First, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering. Paul is the first one saved in the body of Christ. Paul is the example, the pattern for anybody who's ever saved after that is the fact that we are saved not based upon what we do or who we are, but based upon our faith in who Christ is and what he's done for us. It's a picture of grace. Paul's a classic example. If anybody didn't deserve to be saved, it was Paul. But he's the picture of God's grace. And that started the age of grace, the dispensation of grace in which we call. Today, God's new program, its gospel is different than Israel's. It's the same God. That's why there are similarities. But it's a different message. It's the gospel of grace. It's faith alone. If you get saved, if you've trusted in anything else, church membership, water baptism, good works, giving your money, if that's what you're trusting, you're going to hell. Amen. It's only faith that Christ died for your sins, who was buried, he rose again. That's enough to satisfy a holy and righteous God for the payment for your sins and for my sins. Amen. Now, if you've not done that, you're not saved, you need to get saved. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's good preaching, Jim. Now, <laughs> Galatians chapter 1. I'm giving you a lot of verses now. Just follow me, please. There's a, this is important. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Did you hear that? He didn't get it from anybody else. Christ personally revealed it to Paul. He says in verse 16 and following, to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen immediately. I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them, which were apostles, the twelve, before me. But I went into Arabia and returned again into Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and bode with him 15 days. Chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. Then 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also, and I went up by what? Christ told him to go up and explain his gospel to him and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. I didn't want to embarrass them or contradict them or have a conflict with them. So Paul goes up and explains his gospel to them. Now ask this question here. If the same message as the 12, the same gospel as the 12, why Paul? Why didn't the 12 do it? Why go and explain his gospel to the 12 if it's the same gospel? Why would there, why were, why would there be any need to explain if it's the same gospel? And they came to an agreement, Galatians 2, 9. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, that we should go to the heathen and they into the circumcision. Now let me just say something about that. For the 12 to agree with that, they knew God had, was doing a new thing. Because God had told them to go into all the world. Get Israel saved first, then go to the world. But they're saying, we're not going to the world. We're just going to stay with the Jewish people. That had to be revealed to them that Paul's the one who goes to the world with his new gospel message. For them to say no to it, that would have been disobedience if it were not correct. Amen? Now, Paul's gospel, what is it? 1 Corinthians 15, 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, 
that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. None of the 12 taught this, that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Not for salvation, they never taught that. Romans chapter 1, verse 16, 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, death, burial, and resurrection. For it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greeks. For therein the gospel is the righteousness God of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. We just put our faith in that gospel. Chapter 2, verse 16. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to what? My gospel. Not the twelve's gospel, but my gospel. The gospel that Jesus Christ himself revealed to me for the dispensation of grace. That's what he's saying. Chapter 4, verse 5 says this. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. Amen. No works, faith. He said, chapter 5, verse 1, therefore being justified by faith. How do you get justified? Faith in the gospel and the gospel alone. Paul explains that we in the body church, the body of Christ, we don't follow Christ's earthly ministry that was under law or the kingdom truths there. Today we follow Christ's heavenly ministry. He's the head of the body of Christ. We identify today with Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. 2 Corinthians 5, 14, 15. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Christ's death, burial, and resurrection has become my death, burial, and resurrection. When he died, I died. When he was buried, my sins buried me. And when he rose for justification, I rose justified. His death, burial, and resurrection now is mine to be able to live out in my life. We live in a heavenly body truth that's been revealed in Paul's epistle. Now just follow me here. I know I'm giving you a lot of verses. I'm sorry. But you're not just hearing little fairy and fable stories. Amen? You hear the truth. And one day, I'm hoping that it'll sink in. With all my heart, I hope that. 2 Corinthians 5, 16. Wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh, yea? Now get this. Though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. We don't follow his earthly ministry. Behold, all things are become new. Now we follow his heavenly ministry. We're going up to heaven. Israel's looking for the new earth, or looking for uh, the earth and his kingdom here. Amen? Amen. Romans 16, 25. Now, to him that is the power to establish you according to my gospel and preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. A mystery of truth hidden but now revealed. God kept it secret and he kept it secret through all this time then finally revealed to Saul of Tarsus who became the great apostle Paul with the gospel of grace message for us today. Amen. Nobody knew it until revealed to Paul. That's what he says. And then in Colossians 1, 25, where have I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 2 and following, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote uh, for in a few words. And then he goes on to state there in verse 5 and following, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. In other words... 
We used to have to go through Israel. No longer. Jew or Gentile has to go through the gospel to be a part of the body of Christ. It's equal footing. Nobody favored here. Just in Christ alone, faith alone, and the gospel alone. Amen? Amen? Now, putting all this together now, we can begin to understand the importance of rightly dividing. We no longer need to be confused, misled, or think there are contradictions in the Bible. Now I know that God dealt with Israel. He deals with the body of Christ. One day he'll deal with Israel again. But today it's different than there. This was different message than this message here that we have today. And these following verses, I just make the comparison. Example, salvation for Israel, James 2.18. Yes, a man may say that Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Verse 24, did I give that to you? Yeah. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and hath not works? Can faith save him? Now James wrote to who? The 12 tribes of Israel. They had certain requirements. Now, you come over to us today, Acts 16, 30 and 31, and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, what? Believe. Believe. No works involved. Just believe in who Christ is and what he's done for you. Galatians 3, 26, For ye are all the children of God, how? By faith in Christ Jesus. And then think about the law. Matthew 23, 1 and following. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and said to his disciples, saying, The scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore, whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. What they tell you to do about Moses and the commandments, you do that. Now you don't do the way they live, but you do the commandments that Moses tells you to do. He says you do those commandments. James 2.10 says this here, for whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. So back here, there was keeping the commandments. But yet, over here for us, Romans six fourteen, he says this, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. You see that? The law is not condemning us any longer, we that are saved only to lost people. Now that's important. People try to place you under the law today. We're not under law, we're under grace. And then what about healing? You see all these people on TV, Benny Hinn and all of them? And you see all this stuff. What about healing? Matthew 10, 7 following. And as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils freely you have received, freely give. Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your... Boy, that just disqualifies everybody today, doesn't it? That's all they talk about is money. Amen? But they healed during those times. What about healing today? Paul said this, 2 Timothy 4.20, he says this, Erastus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at my leadum. What? Something changed. Something changed from this program to this program. And let me just say something to you. Jews require a sign. And since God had sent Israel temporarily a sign, do you know what he did with the signs? He set them aside also. Now we have a completed word. Amen? What about giving? Will a man rob God? You have robbed me, but you say, where and have you robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat and so on. So it was under Israel's program, you needed to tithe. But today, 2 Corinthians 9 says, Every man according as he has purpose, purpose in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver, and God is able to to make all grace abound toward you that you having all sufficiency and so on. Under the dispensation of grace, it's grace giving. Today, there's no amount that God demands. 
But there's no limit either. You can give 10 if you want. You can give more. You're not limited. But it's grace giving. As God's prospered you, you give. Amen? It's that simple. And then also, what about prayer? What about prayer? Matthew 21, 22. And all things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. And by the way, he's talking to his apostles, his followers. Have you prayed for something that didn't come to pass? What happened? Oh, you must not have had enough faith. That's what they tell you. What about prayer today? Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. And what will happen? And the peace of God, which passeth, passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts. He might answer it. He might do it a different way. He might say no. He might say yes. But one thing you'll have, you'll have peace because you gave it to God and God knows what you need before you ever ask him and he will meet the needs the way he wants to ask, that he wants to answer it. It's not us demanding God because we have faith. Amen? Got two more things. Forgiveness. Matthew 6. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Hey, let me say something to you. Under their program, it was conditional forgiveness. If you do this, I'll do this. If you forgive, I'll forgive. In other words, if you don't forgive, you know what? I'm not, hello? I'm not going to forgive you. You want to be under that kind of bondage? For today, Ephesians 4.32, And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath. It's past, present tense, forgiven you. Colossians uh, 2.13, the last phrase there, With him hath forgiven you all trespass. Do you know something? For me to be forgiven is never dependent upon me forgiving anybody. Why? Because all my sins have already been forgiven. All my past sin, all my present sin, all my future sin, it's all under the blood of Jesus Christ. So to say, I'll be forgiven, no, no, no. All my sins have been forgiven. Do you see the difference? Conditional forgiveness, unconditional forgiveness. Woo! The last one. And everybody said? Amen. Boy, I never thought this preacher would stop using these verses. <laughs> Amen? Baptism, Mark 1, 4. John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for what? For the remission of sins. Matthew 3, 11. I indeed baptize you with water to repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost with fire. In that verse are three baptisms, water, water, Spirit and judgment. So it's not, when you see the word baptized, it doesn't always mean water. But the Jew had to be water baptized because that prepared him to become a priest and they were to be a kingdom of priests. Huh? Now, when you take that here and you take it out of context and you place it here, you get all kinds of problems. You need to be baptized to be saved. Well, you do if you're a Jew. Hello? What for us today? Paul says this, for Christ sent me not to baptize. You know the 12 can never say that. He sent me but to preach the gospel. You see, God revealed to Paul with this new message, it's no longer necessary for water baptism. Now at the beginning, Paul did some Jewish things because that's all he knew. God's revelation came to him a little bit at a time. He also circumcised. He also spoke in tongues. He also took vows. He also went to the temple. But Paul said, to the Jew, I became a Jew, that I might win the Jew. So he did it because he understood where they were coming from. That didn't change his message whatsoever. And then it states in Ephesians 4, 5, one Lord, one faith, 
There's only one baptism today. Do you think that's water baptism? Huh? That's spirit baptism. When you say, God, I know I'm a sinner, but I believe Christ, your son, died for my sins, was buried, rose again. The Spirit of God, when you put your faith in that, took you out of your position of being an Adam, a sinner, lost on your way to hell, and he baptized you, he identified you, he placed you into the body of Christ. By the Spirit of God, you were fused together in that body of Christ. Now, Christ is your head. No longer are you back there. Now you're in Christ. Amen? That's the only baptism that's necessary for today. Now I close with these comments. It's my first closing. (laughs) And my last, I promise. You think these verses wore you out? They wore me out. (laughs) Satan's been successful in getting most people to neglect Paul's epistles. Satan's great deception over Christendom has been in not rightly dividing and mixing all these together like that post office with the mail piled up in the corner. And as a result of that, it's created confusion, division, differences, denominations, church traditions. Most people today, saved or lost, place themselves most of the time under the law. They want the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is kingdom living given to the people of Israel. Isn't that interesting? Many try to uncover or rediscover the miraculous signs of the four Gospels or Pentecost. Most are trying to carry out the Jewish Great Commission. And what you have in Christendom today, because they do not rightly divide, and all the scriptures, it's just whatever you want, and you just mix it up, and that's what you, you stand for. It's created a babble of confusion. Amen. Amen? Now, here's the tragedy. When you begin to see the truth, I was a Baptist pastor for 29 years. That last year, this really began to come to me. When... You begin to see this truth because there's opposition to this truth, because there's a cost to follow this truth, because there's a central mentality of people toward their family, their friends, their church, their denomination, their traditions. Even though they begin to see some of the truth, many of them wimp out. Bunch of wimps. Amen? Amen? from being a biblicist and following the truth. And it's time that when you begin to see truth of God's word, you stand up for that truth regardless of what man or church or denomination or tradition tries to cram down your throat. Amen? Amen. Amen. And for a word of encouragement, if you've been thinking about this, We've been, we've been where you are right now. And I challenge you, seek the scriptures. Search the scriptures. See if those things are so. That's what Paul says, or uh, Luke says in Acts 17, 11. Last two verses. 1 Thessalonians 2, 4. I skipped one, that's okay, guys. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel... Even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. When truth is is preached toward you, you seek it out if it's a truth, you follow it. If it's not, you discard it, you're going about your business. But one day you'll stand before God and you'll give an account of how you responded to that truth. I believe that. Our responsibility as believers now who have come to understand these dispensations, time past, but now today and ages to come. God, he has said to us in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9 and 10, our responsibility, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, 
to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places, the enemies of God might be known by the church. We make known to the enemies of God the manifold wisdom of God. And the manifold wisdom is right here, we're in a new dispensation. It's the mystery program. It's the dispensation of the gospel of grace. When you get saved, you're part of the one new man, the body of Christ. We are saved by faith alone in the gospel alone. Completely different than these other dispensations. Amen. 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 Father, we love you. Thank you for the patience of the people, for sitting, listening. And I just pray something might have clicked. Something, a light might have come on in somebody's mind and heart. What a wonderful privilege we have to be living today, to be able to share the gospel of the grace of God, the mystery program. May we never back away from it. May we always be gracious, kind, but yet believing. In Jesus' name. And everybody said?